It's entangled at many different moments, this technological world and the social world, right? It's not just that there's the technological solutions out there and then you need to look for some kind of acceptance. You have to imagine there's tons of actors participating in a political process. It's a mess. We need to have a governance system that somehow fits the ecological system, right? And from a social point of view, it's not so easy. I think we from scientific institutions, we overestimate the influence on political decision making. Just because we're all saying that we don't want to be in the ivory tower doesn't mean that we're getting out of the ivory tower, right? That is Manuel Fischer, professor from the University of Bern, Switzerland, and the head of the Environmental Social Sciences Department at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology, Erwag. Armed with a political science background, Manuel and his Policy Analysis and Environmental Governance Research Group have sought to understand the complexity of social dynamics and collaboration on a range of environmental issues, both in times of crises and in times of calm. From topics of changing energy policy due to climate change and major disasters, to harmonizing our relationship with the ecological world. My name is Peter Marcus Bach, and this is the Grand Challenges Podcast, a show about inspiring individuals who are stepping up to tackle the global challenges that our world is facing in their own unique ways. We reflect on the many out-of-the-box ways our guests have navigated the complexity and intricacies of the environment at the cutting edges of science, engineering, technology, and design. On today's show, Manuel and I discuss the reality of doing social sciences in the political space, the intricate dynamics among different actors in the context of energy and ecology, and the opposing roles of the so-called devil shift and devil's advocate. Manuel also reflects on the reality of when and whether science can have an impact on guiding future policies and how scientists can leave their infamous ivory tower. Detailed information is provided in the show notes over at peterambach.com slash podcast. Thank you for joining us today and please enjoy the show. It's good to have you here, Manuel. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Good to be here. And you were just commenting on me looking like a professional interviewer. I thought that was quite nice. Thank you very much. Coming from yourself, who has done a lot of interviews from what I've read in a lot of your papers. Yeah, I guess. What is it about me? Um, how would you say? <laughs> no, that's true. That's true. I, did, I didn't even think about the interviews that we've been doing. Yeah, that's quite some time ago. That's something, sometimes I think that I would like to do, again, more fieldwork, because that's where the interesting stuff is happening. But then also, you know, my role as a researcher has changed a little bit over time. So I'm no longer going out to the field that much, actually. Okay, but I guess it's like um, for a social scientist, and you are the second social scientist on this show, so... Uh, you know, that's it's going to be interesting to see what your perspectives are. But I feel like for social scientists, that's like a badge of honor, the number of interviews you've done rather than the number of papers you've published. Well, you still get a position in the money because you, you publish papers, basically, right? You can discuss yeah. whether that's right or wrong, but that's the reality out there. I guess doing interviews or going deep into any other kind of empirical source is key, of course. That's basically the data, if you want. That's the material we're working with as social scientists. That's why I enjoy sometimes, you know, having workshops with stakeholders or being in interaction with different kind of actors, just hearing their stories from the reality of policymaking out there. I guess that's important. To, yeah. Even if in a situation where like doing empirical work is not my day-to-day -day work. Yeah, I, I certainly felt the rewarding experience of being able to talk to stakeholders and getting data in that way, because I feel like you make that human connection, which I feel sometimes we miss in doing science. And you need to be able to make that connection because I think you understand how to then build a narrative or build a story that allows you to communicate your work and then create change, I guess. Would you see it that way? I wouldn't go too far in creating change. No. <laughs> I'm not sure if we are creating change. That's certainly not the end goal or very, very, very far away end goal, right? But it's true that talking to people, although that's, of course, not the only source in social sciences, right? That's important. I mean, it's just, that's just one of many different types of empirical sources we can work with. Very often nowadays, we talk about online surveys where you basically never really in touch with people. You're talking about documentary sources. You're talking about analysis of media data, of Twitter data, etc. where, of course, there's real people behind. It's stories about real people. It's stories about actors, about what they're doing, about how they're receiving things, what they like, what they don't like what they support, etc. But it's not actually sitting in a room with a person during an interview. So that's a very specific type of data gathering. And there's others where you have these human interactions. There's a workshop type of data gathering. There's observational type of data gathering, like being part of a meeting and observing how people interact and behave. That's another type of data gathering that is there in the social sciences. I think one aspect of having the human interaction is first you get a good feeling 
for how the uh, like you get something more than just the pure data if you want it is the pure message right you get something mm. about you know how the person is feeling whether the person is stressed at the moment or not and and that might influence obviously the types of answers that they're giving and so it's to get a feeling for the situation when the person gives you an empirical information it's important to interpret that that empirical information Plus, what I always found rewarding in a way is that very often if you go out there and talk to people for data gathering in the sense of doing interviews in the sense of data gathering, the people out there are often impressed or they have some appreciation for your work. They think it's interesting that the researcher looks into social processes in more detail. They're often happy to talk, yeah. right? And that again gives you a good feeling that you're doing an interesting thing. And I think oftentimes what we tend to forget, and this is why this research is incredibly important, is that we have technologies that can help the world, but when you don't have the governance arrangements, when you don't have the institutional capacity to actually implement that technology, then even the best ideas can fall flat at the end of the day. Absolutely. But it's not only about the institutional arrangements where that can basically give a framework to the implementation of ideas. It's even the development of ideas or the development of technical solutions for whatever problem that is intrinsically a social process, if mm. you want, right? This is about the collaboration of people. Yep. It's about the incentives of people. It's about the communication of ideas. It's about motivation for doing work, for seeing opportunities, etc. So it's entangled at many different moments, this technological world and the social world. Right? Mm. It's not just that there's the technological solutions out there and then you need to look for some kind of acceptance that's a, a very simple way of seeing it yeah no very true and i guess it, yeah the rabbit hole goes much deeper than what we see at the surface when we read different research papers or we look at different policy briefs and i'm looking forward to get into that sure so you look at governance arrangements, decision-making processes, and really that political space. Mm -hmm. Does that stem from you wanting to be president when you were a child? I know quite a few people in my childhood, they always dreamed of being the next president of a particular country. I'm going to be the next president. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. You, you don't know yet. Of which country? I'm going to invent the country, my own. I'm going to, <laughs> going to declare independence of my home. No, I never really thought about going into politics, I guess. I'm not so sure why I got interested in that. I'm not uncomfortable in the role of, you know, talking to people, trying to understand their situations, trying to find a solution, etc. Or even having some kind of leadership role a little bit. That's something that I've been doing in different contexts. Real politics or going into some kind of political role takes a lot of time. Sure. It takes a lot of commitment. So I never really got into that. That said, and that's, I think, an important message as a researcher about governance, there's many different political roles out there. And it's not just president is not the only one. Yeah. Let's say managing a neighborhood association or oh, yeah. contributing to a local initiative about, you know, distributing used toys in the neighborhood or that, that can be seen as a political role. It's basically, you know, organizing something in society that is more than just the individual behavior but it's kind of doing something for a community. And that can scale up into a political system at the end. Yeah. So it's important to realize that the political world out there is very complex and that we're all in a way part of it, right? Depends on how you see it, but there's many, many different roles. And the president is just the most famous one, yeah. although we don't even have one here in Switzerland. But if you're engaged in a local association, even at your workplace, if you're taking some kind of association role, defending the interests of... PhD students, in a way, you're in a political role. And that's a nice broader definition of it and also highlights that there's a, the consideration of scale of this kind of process that we need to look at, which you have also done quite a lot in the research that you've undertaken. Maybe just for uh, just the one one you did say it, right? We are currently sitting in Switzerland, nice and rainy, uh, the winter weather. But Switzerland itself has a very interesting governance structure. Maybe give us a one one What's your one-minute take on teaching our international audience about how Switzerland's political system works? It's what you call a consensus democracy. But consensus doesn't come out of just because you want to be nice and you know find a solution that everybody's agreeing with. It's basically a system that needed to manage the very different fragmented interests. There's uh, linguistic fragmentation, there's socioeconomic fragmentation, there's uh, religious fragmentation in this country. And so a consensus system basically allows to include all of these forces into a political process. 
and not have one dominated over the other. Although that has, of course, developed over time and different interests, different groups, religious groups, uh, social groups, etc., have in a way forced their entry into the political system. And I think what's also quite unique is the referendum system where there's a certain level of I guess, ownership or call it power in the populace in making the decisions or supporting the decision making? Yes, although there's the referendum and there's the popular initiative. One is proposing, the latter one is proposing a new constitutional amendment, basically, and the former one is opposing a change that has been decided upon within the political system. You can do that by collecting signatures among the population and then you basically have a vote on a substantive issue among the population. It's often seen as not so much, of course, it's an involvement of the population in the political system, but it's also a tool for organized interests to actually have influence, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't collect 100,000 signatures just by being a motivated individual, although you might maybe be able to do that very often there's organized interest behind, there's political parties, there's big interest groups that use these popular initiative and the referendum as a means to influence the political process, right? So in that sense, yes, it's an additional political right to the individual population, to the individual member of the political society, right? That is not there in other countries or in less articulated ways, but it's really also a means for different groups to make sure that their voice is heard within the political process. And it is related to what I mentioned before. It's an element of that consensus democracy, and it's related to that. So there's this link. You know, some people have tried to see whether there's some kind of causal link between two elements. But there's some relation between the fact that you have that means of the referendum to influence policies and the fact that you have a consensus democracy where many people are involved, you have important consultation mechanisms at many different scales of the political system, that's not least because if you don't do that, at the end, with direct democracy, people can oppose a decision, mm. which is costly, yeah. which basically makes a political process fail at the end. After all the uh, time and effort People investment. want to avoid that, right? Yeah. If that's your political project as a party, as a party leader, as a member of government, you don't want it to fail at the end. Yeah. But you know that there's this potential that the population might vote against it. And so in order to avoid that, you need to include the relevant set of interest groups from the very beginning. Yeah. So both mechanisms are in a way linked. No, very true. And I think you've looked at some of the intricate dynamics of it, especially in the context of environmental issues, which... I'm very excited to then talk about, in particular, a few key concepts. Mm -hmm. But first of all, you're now at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology, as well as the University of Bern. So adjunct position and dual position, call it that. How do we get here? So you studied at the University of Geneva first, and you did your PhD there in the Department of Political Science and International Relations. And then after that, you did a short trip to the U.S., that was kind of the last part of my PhD. A lot of people did that at that time. That was related to the funding structure. The Swiss National Science Foundation usually funded projects for three years, while three years was very often too short for actually doing a PhD. And at the same time, these early postdoc grants, I think that was what it was called, were informally open to finishing PhDs. Uh -huh. okay. And so many people applied for such a mobility grant, which was not really intended for that, I think, if I got it right. But that allowed me to spend 10 months at the University of North Carolina in the US. Yeah. Along the similar lines of the topic that you were looking at but I guess in a very different context or different political system as um, well. Well, that was totally independent of the political system, actually. You oh, know, okay. I was basically there to write up my stuff. Ah. That was nice and it allowed me to get in touch with new people and kind of also, I guess, to think more independently or to be more independent as a researcher. But I didn't really do empirical work at all about the U.S. political system. Of course, mm -hmm. it always helps to be in some other context. You have to explain, you know, what you take for granted in your political system is totally unknown elsewhere or is understood in a different way elsewhere. So that, I guess, it pushes you to, to be aware of how country-level institutions, like the ones that we were talking about before, how they matter for policymaking and how they're seen elsewhere, etc. Yeah, no, very So true. in that sense, yes... But I didn't do any empirical work in the U.S. I was there 
hanging out on campus and talking to people and doing a lot of work to write on my PhD, basically. Okay. Did you um, add a bit of decision making into it, into deciding when you were going to do your stint there? Because I'll give you a personal example from my end. In the first few years when I was between Switzerland and Australia, people were always making fun of me for my expert decision making because I chose to be in Australia during the winter and then come to Switzerland when the winter started. And yeah, that was kind of, um, I don't know, opportunistic, but it sort of worked out in my schedule. It just didn't work out in terms of the weather. Was that uh, <laughs> were those were there similar cases in your decisions to move? Um, later, at some point, uh, now with the US, I guess, and I never really did a lot of you know traveling back and forth. Mm. At some point, I spent five or six weeks on a visit in Stockholm, mm -hmm. and I smartly chose that to be the second part of November and December, ah. where. There's not a lot of light, let's say. Yeah, that's It's true. probably not. Um, I, I enjoyed it still. But if you ask people, that's not the best time to visit the I northern get, part of Europe, right? I guess it's the choice of preference. Would you rather have daylight all day or nighttime all day? I've certainly visited Sweden in those uh, time periods. And yeah, it's a very different kind of feeling. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not super sensitive to these things, I think. But if I could choose again to spend uh, a couple of weeks in Stockholm, I would try to go there in the summer. I guess. Certainly much uh, nicer because I think you also enjoy hiking a lot. I do remember once we were going to a conference and <laughs> you decided to choose your conference hotel on top of a mountain and then you traveled down. And this was in Davos, I think, so Absolutely. quite scenic. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I try to connect tourism with the conference travels. And it makes yes. total sense. I mean, I've certainly done that too. And I guess <laughs> Everybody as does it, I guess. Yeah, right? as academics, we have the ability to, or the flexibility to link that. No, definitely. Yeah, I've been biking to a conference as well. You've been biking to conferences? Yes. Cross-border? Yeah. To Austria. Ah, yeah, I guess that's still quite far because you have ah. to go through Liechtenstein in some cases and yeah. in other cases you yeah. can get directly there. But I guess, yeah, now you're back in Switzerland. Well, you've been back after that short stint in the US uh, and then your visit to Sweden as well. But you've had the chance to really observe over the long term how Swiss policies, especially environmental issues, have been evolving and changing. And this has allowed you to delve deeper into particularly the aspect of collaboration between actors. I guess, you know, for the uninitiated, we probably should define, we've been mentioning the word actors, and we're not really referring to movie actors, but that's the most common way of referring to a certain individual in a political process, decision-making process, any kind of social process. Yeah, sometimes people talk about stakeholders, but that's more if you're talking about one specific issue and then you have the, you know, the people out there that have a stake in that issue. Sometimes you talk about organizations, political organizations, public organizations, and very often people talk about actors, you know, as if they would place some kind of theater piece out there with different roles, with a script in a way, and, and or, or let's say political institutions that give you specific resources and give you specific roles in a process that is on stage and it is also observed by the public. So in a way, in a way the... Um, you can see a disc as kind of a theater piece with an undefined outcome often. Though, yeah, okay, right? interesting. Yeah, nice way of thinking about it. And I guess, yeah, the keyword roles, you know, that also really links nicely with the theater piece. And that as an observer or the social scientist observing the process, in a way, you're watching the theater piece and you're analyzing the theater piece. I, exactly. I'm not part of it. I try not to be part of it. Although, of course, as an individual, you're always part of any kind of social process. We're part of society, of course. But I think it's important to try to keep that observer role, which is not so easily combined with the participant role, right? Mm. In that sense, you should also ideally hide any of your political preferences or your, you know, as a member of society, you have your preferences, of course. I think it's important as an observer of political processes to be as neutral as possible, to be as objective as possible. Of course, yeah. we all know that's not always possible. That's hard. But thinking about how you could do that is important to be a neutral observer and a good observer, I think. Mm. And I guess that brings into the play an interesting paper that I saw. And when I was reading it, I thought this is fascinating. And that's where you distinguish or the paper sort of distinguishes between the good and the bad guys and not quite that. But it talks about this phenomenon known as the devil shift. So I guess we're looking at processes of collaboration in making policies and coming up with solutions for a larger populace that reaches agreement among most of the actors in a 
political process or yeah, any kind of socio-ecological, socio-economic process. And in an environmental context, this could be a new energy policy. You certainly looked at some of those and we'll get into one interesting study for that. But also around water, environmental management, climate change adaptation. What is this devil shift? It's an idea that doesn't even come from politics or governance studies at the basis. And that's actually true for many political science theories, I would say. There's theories of individual behavior behind that. But it's basically a theory about misperception of actors in a political process, right? So there's, you have to imagine there's tons of actors participating in a political process. It's a mess. Mm. It's hard for political actors to know who else is relevant, who else is influential, at what point in time, whom they should talk to, who else might share their ideas or might not. At the same time, they have to organize. So you were saying, of course, the goal of a political process is to have some kind of consensus solution where a majority of or a good majority of organizations agree. That's probably the kind of the, the nice way to put it. You could also put it very often. That's very often the case, right? It's a fight between two coalitions. Okay. So that's also one of the pictures that applies more or less to different types of political systems. But you could also say that, well, people gather around others. They try to form coalitions with those that are somehow like-minded. And then you observe in a very simple way, in a new energy law, you observe the coalition that basically wants to go with non-renewables and keep things as they are. And there's a coalition on the other side that wants to push renewables with financial incentives and whatever, right? Yep. That could be a situation. Um, so you have two coalitions. And then what the devil shift says is that actors in these coalitions, they tend to misperceive actors from the opposing coalition. Right. They, on the one hand, they tend to think that actors from the opposing coalitions are more evil as mm. they actually are. So in the sense, they overestimate their ideological distance to people from the other coalition. They feel threatened in a way. They, which as a consequence exactly makes them feel more threatened. And the threat also comes from their overestimation of influence. So according to that theory, they tend to overestimate the influence of the opposing coalitions, right? There's a couple of explanations for that on the individual level, the social, psychological theories of behavior, etc. Probably not going to go into detail there, but what's important is that the coalition structures, having two coalitions, having us and them is also a shortcut for many political mm. actors, right? It's an easy way to think about the mess that is out there in a political process. Rather than a we, a blame shifting kind of mentality, which I think we see happen way too many times. When we well, I agree news. that we see it too many times and probably increasingly so. And that, yeah, I don't think that's a good development overall, but there's also very good reasons why people think in easier concept of us in our coalition and them, right? But once you have it in a, it's us against them, and they are too influential, right? The opponents are influential. The opponents are far away in terms of their positions. That makes it very hard to find political compromise. Mm. And, and polarization is just increasing in a lot of issues that we're facing nowadays. So it's becoming even more challenging, I guess. There's, yeah, polarization is, of course, a complicated concept. There are many different aspects. I know that we tend to say that polarization has been increasing in like the typical Western democracies that we observe. I recently read an interview with actually my former PhD office mate, okay. project mate, who's dealing with these questions of polarization. At least what they observe in Switzerland, their project is that Switzerland has in a way always been polarized because we have pretty strong parties that are on the left and on the right side of the political spectrum and the center parties have been weakened over time. But that's not a very new development. That's a development that has been going on in the last 30 years already. What they're also saying is if you look at the positions of the individual members of society, there's not many indications that there's a stronger polarization. Mm -hmm. What is certainly polarized is the media discourse. Or mm -hmm. Again, that's my own uh, interpretation of things, right? But there's the media discourse, the pro and cons, how they're reported in the media. I think that has been polarized because the media logic rewards strong, clear... Sensationalist. Sensationalist positions. And that is certainly very tricky to navigate if we are not aware of these kinds of sources of polarization. 
coming back to the devil shift, and that was an interesting sort of tangent to it, I guess how it relates at the political level. But coming back to the devil shift, in a way, just like we discussed the different scales of political processes, you found that this was prevalent in specific groups of actors and that there were certain groups that could help, I guess, overcome this kind of negative bias or negative consequence. In particular, you looked at how this shift occurred at the actor level and at the process level. But what you found in particular was that interest groups and political parties, they suffer more from this phenomenon, whereas state actors, and I might get you to give me some examples of that in a minute, that they didn't suffer as much, but could also act as potential mediators to perhaps shed some light on this inherent bias. Mm -hmm. So let me start with political parties there. Of course, political parties are in a constant competition for attention, in the end for votes, right? Also the competition between political parties in the Swiss system in terms of votes is not that strong as in other political systems, but they're in a way, again, rewarded by having clear positions, by blaming opponents, taking their position within a political process. They're maybe not mainly interested or in finding a consensus solution. They're also interested in making their positions clear, making their positions clearly available, talking to their voters. Right? Mm. That's at least one function of political parties. It's a clear motivation. It's, it's, it's understandable. A exactly. That's one of the motivation. And participating in finding good policies is another motivation, right? Yep. But they don't always go together, of course. And so in that sense, they're more exposed also in these coalition dynamics, right? And they win from having a clear stance within the coalition. And while state actors, in a way, they don't have to be re-elected, they don't have to be in the media, they don't want to be in the media, I guess, mm. right? It's rather their role to actually organize a political process and try to bring the different actors together to talk to each other to elaborate some kind of compromise solution. Yeah. There's probably a second argument why state actors are less prone to these kind of devil shift ideas or, or biases as opposed to political parties. Political parties have very few resources in Switzerland. Okay. And of course, if you don't have resources, that means you're not that knowledgeable about all the details, about all the implications of a political process. That knowledge and these resources are with the state administration and with specific interest groups. And of course, as a political party, you need certain cues you need certain simplifications because you don't have all the detailed information about the different policy options, about the consequences, etc. And that, again, drives the bias towards seeing the world in, you know, it's this or that and it's us against them. Whereas with state actors and with state actors, we're talking about, you know, people in public administration that are doing a lot of work in preparing new policies, yep. in preparing different options, in preparing all the relevant documents that allow policymakers to take decisions in the end. Then where the motivations are, I guess, more in line with trying to keep a certain stable operation and less around, you know, garnering support and attention. Actively. Absolutely. Yeah. Which makes total sense. And I guess, in a way, we need that collaboration, a keyword collaboration across different levels in order to reach a consensus and that mediation as well. And one other keyword, which is not mentioned in the work, but it comes to mind because it appears in some of the work I've done, is the term devil's advocate. So yet another devil. We're talking about lots of devilish things today. <laughs> Next is deviled eggs. Um, <laughs> devil's advocates I've seen pop up when I'm discussing ideas around blue-green infrastructure and how in a policy process in adapting cities to climate change and using ancient cities to harness ecology, to improve water management, oftentimes devil's advocates can be a sort of champion to help people in a constructive way question some of their decisions, question some of their ideas. And do you think there's room for that? Do you think this idea of a devil's advocate could, in a way, deal with the devil's shift? Hmm. Could the devil deal with the devil? Fight fire with fire, right? Exactly. Tricky. I don't know if the devil's advocate per se is a role. It's not a role that I have thought of in the context of political processes, I have to say. I think what can help with the devil's shift, though, is, you know, ideally people talk to each other in conferences, in committees. They have time to exchange about their positions. And there maybe, of course, you know, they can play around with arguments and one actor can have that role of a devil's advocate. I'm not sure about that. But having time to talk to each other and to negotiate, even behind closed doors, 
not needing to, you know, after every session of negotiation, make your position publicly available on Twitter or having to talk to a journalist and take a firm stance and a clear position. Mm. I think that's important. And they exist. I mean, if you observe policymaking, not just from media, but as a political scientist, you realize that there's a lot of things happening in the day-to-day political work where it's not people shouting at each other as they do in the the media, right? At least in this country, maybe it's different than others. There's a lot of constructive discussion where people, you know, I'm not saying they try to understand the position of the opponent, but in a way they're interested in having the different options laid out on the table and then start the negotiation from there. And there you have a much more detailed understanding of the opponent's position. You have a detailed understanding of the different parts that makes up the opponent coalition. And it's not just us versus them in that situation, right? But you get a more detailed understanding. But that needs time. That needs space in Mm -hmm. in a sense of opportunities to come together and talk to each other. And it needs resources to be able to deal with those complications and uncertainties of what the positions of the others are, what our positions are, etc. Transparency, turning us and them into a we, and really building trust, confidence and collaboration. And this is something that I found fascinating when I read one of your papers, which looks at this kind of process in a time of crisis or when we're dealing with shocks. So the Fukushima nuclear accident in 2011 changed energy policies across the world. And you had the chance to actually study changes in Swiss policy around nuclear energy and just generally the energy policy in 2050 compared to what was before on this kind of actor dynamic. And I guess one thing that really stood out from that was in situations of crises, we need to do something, quite frankly. So actors are put under pressure to actually make decisions. We certainly also see that in cases of drought, we've had some previous guests on the episode talk about how this decision-making happened during the millennium drought in Australia. But in the energy crisis, where the severity of such a nuclear accident can really influence the psychology in the decision-makers, the dynamics change completely. They do. And I think if you look at different theories of policymaking, one of the clear factors out there is external shocks. Hmm. If something happens, if people die, if something unexpected happens with a large impact on public discussion, on public priorities, etc., like a, a nuclear accident, like a war, like a drought, like a flooding, if you're going to go to water politics, that's when things change. Hmm. Very often, if you don't have these kind of things, nothing changes, yep. which is, you know, in a way, it's, very, it's a very simple idea. It doesn't mean that things always change if you have these kind of shocks, but the likelihood that things actually change in policy, that energy policy goes from one logic into another, it's certainly higher if you have some kind of external shocks. Now, that said, you said, well, countries in the world have changed their energy policies after Fukushima. I'm not even sure that's true if you look at it in the longer term. In Swiss- reality. Switzerland certainly has, Germany has. I'm not so sure if in any other countries, even including Japan, <laughs> depends on what aspects you look at, right? Plus, what makes it a bit complicated to talk about that is that we're, of course, in the next energy crisis, right? So Fukushima is not the last big shock in the energy policymaking world, but we have uh, current ones ongoing. Mm. But yes, in times of crisis, if in a way the facts on the ground change, right? Yep. And, uh, you suddenly see the risks of a nuclear accident. Also, people have been talking about this before, of course. Then policymakers or any kind of actors out there have an incentive or a window of opportunity also to propose new solutions yep. or to propose solutions that have always been there but have never had a majority or in, enough support to actually be pushed through as policies. And I guess you said it, we can propose the new solutions, but whether there's even a success of them being adopted into policy, I guess really depends on the level of collaboration. And so there are several drivers that you've identified that sort of influence how different actors, in this case now in the energy space, would collaborate with each other, whether it's in times of crisis and high uncertainty or times of stability. And these were similarity in preferences, the perceived power, so I guess power dynamics and level of influence, and then also opportunity. In particular, you consider the relational opportunity, the institutional opportunity, and the social opportunity. And what's fascinating about these three aspects is that two of them seem to be the driving force in collaborations across any kind of sector, which a follow-up study you did actually showed, which is the first two. So similarity in preferences and perceived power. 
seems to me like ingredients for, again, polarization and camps, the us versus them kind of argument. Absolutely. But politics, to some degree, politics is also about, I'm not saying it's about us versus them, but it's about defending your interests, the interests of your constituencies, and making sure that your preferences as a group, as a political actor, as an interest group, etc., get heard and get ideally implemented in society, right? So mm. politics is also very much a power game and it's institutionalized societal conflict out there, right? About yeah. the many different ways we should go as a society. So in that sense, yes, people collaborate if they have the same preferences. That's also a very normal thing, I guess. Yeah. We see that very consistently through a lot of political processes. Um, and people obviously collaborate or try to, you know, try to get in touch with those that are influential which is also very normal. If you want to go into the political system and push for your idea, well, it's probably not too wrong to try to talk to those that you know can move things ahead. Yeah. So these are two different factors. And then the other ones that you mentioned, so these uh, opportunity structure, that's more opportunities for actors to talk to each other independently of their preferences. That's the spaces that I mentioned before, mm. right? You have meetings, you have conferences, you have expert groups where the most relevant actors meet and have time to exchange about their positions. The other kind of opportunity structure that's more networks and that's kind of the social networks that we all also have in our private life, right? If you know someone that knows someone that knows someone, you can ideally close that circle and get in touch easier with that person to talk to. And that also provides some trust, you know, in these collaborations. It's actually fascinating, this idea of social networks, because before social media, you would hear about it, I guess, in drips and drabs, but now it's become sort of ubiquitous in our society. But I think only the experts who really delved into it back in the day before any of this existed would really use that as a very powerful tool. I certainly first heard about this idea of a social network through this idea of six degrees of separation, where they say you know everyone by going through six different people. So if you go through your friend's network and by the sixth person, you'll be able to make that connection. Fascinating work indeed. And mm -hmm. that's something that you use actively in your research. So not only do you do work with qualitative data, but then you try to make sense of this qualitative data using more quantitative methods, network analysis, statistics. Can you tell me a bit about what kinds of interesting insights we can gain by doing this kind of social network analysis? So again, as you're saying, social networks are a phenomenon that has, of course, existed way before we're talking about social networks in the sense of social media. Social networks, in a way, is a way to see how different parts of society interact, which makes which makes the concept of society meaningful, right? It's We're not just a bunch of individuals out there, but we're actually talking to each other and we're interacting in many different ways. And that makes us part of a social network. And the idea of that social network is, of course, that it's not just for understanding what happens, it's not just important to look at individuals and somehow aggregated individual preferences, but it's important to look at how the social network per se functions and how that influences individuals and how it influences collective outcomes. Now in politics, that's very much related to what I mentioned at the very beginning. In a governance understanding or our understanding of politics, it's not just about the president. It's about many different actors out there, many different organizations, many different interests that somehow participate in a political process on many different levels. And as soon as you have that mess again, you also realize that these different actors are talking to each other to different degrees, right? And there, yeah. and there you go with the network in a way. So it's a way to understand a little bit the many complex interactions between these actors. I think what is also interesting is that the network per se is not a political phenomena. It's something that we all have around us, right? You all mm -hmm. have a social network that is larger or smaller or more intense or whatever, but it's a very personal experience. So in that sense, it helps. And it's even not always a social thing, right? There's computer networks out there and there's sewer networks out there and there's many other trophic networks among species out there. So it's a very interdisciplinary concept, yep. which I think makes it appealing. With universal kinds of laws, rules, methods. Mm -hmm. yep. I think so. And then it allows you to look into, let me take two examples that we've been talking about before. One is, of course, these coalitions, right? With networks, mm -hmm. you can try to understand a little bit how the, this, the mess of a policymaking process is organized into different 
coalitions that create more closely knitted networks. Yep. Right. To those that are there with the same goal, they probably talk to each other and they try to coordinate their activities and have influence as a coalition. And that can be operationalized through a network. You can also identify the more coordinator roles within the network, right? You can try to find out who in this collaboration logic within the network is bridging different coalitions, mm -hmm. who is in a position where the specific actor can actually talk to both sides of a political conflict and thereby can be an important ingredient into finding a solution or negotiating a compromise. Much like the state actors we mentioned as examples. Very often we observe that state actors, the public admin entities that are dealing with a specific issue, they're in that position that they're actually bringing together the different sides of the political conflict. Yes. Yeah. And this kind of a network analysis can also be expanded beyond just the people themselves. And that is actually a project that you're currently involved in. And actually together with someone we've had on the show before, Janine Bollega from episode 14. And this is where you're starting to combine not just the social aspects, but also the ecological aspects. So really the biophysical world, habitats, species, and just the interconnectedness of nature as well. Could you tell me a bit about that kind of role? And I've also been somewhat involved in that project, but uh, I've left a lot of that depth to you. That connects to what I mentioned before, that the network per se, is kind of an interdisciplinary tool. And the idea behind that research, which it hasn't been developed by me, which is we're applying an idea of other people out there to operationalize a social ecological system through networks. So the, the idea of a social ecological system is, of course, that if you want to try to understand how sustainably managed a given resource is and in general how we can ideally drive our societies and ecosystems into more sustainable functioning, then it's not just about any type of ecosystem functions or ecological behavior or physical properties of a system, but it's very much about the entanglement of these properties with the social world that is connected to that system, that uses resources from that system, that manages that system, that regulates that system. And the idea that colleagues then came up with is to operationalize such a system as a so-called social ecological network. So mm -hmm. you would describe the ecological system as a network of different habitats or species that are interconnected, and you would also describe the social world as a network of different actors that somehow deal with, with the ecological system. And I guess the value add or the real crux of it is when you can start to link the two networks together and you identify ways to then bridge people, but then also bridge the landscape. I guess to illustrate this more concretely, you know, when you look at how animals move across the landscape, which is essential for biodiversity protection because it allows them to exchange their genes and create more variety in the gene pool, we need to create physical environments that allow that movement. So, for example, a golf course which is nice, big and green, managed by one particular organization, may transition into a forest. So I'm um, just thinking frogs, or if you're in Asia, you have monitor lizards, you know, casually strolling. Or in, I think in Africa, you have crocodiles uh, on golf courses, <laughs> casually strolling across there to reach the forest or swamp. This itself, typically in the natural sense, would work if there's no boundaries or borders. But if the two, I guess, actors in charge of these two different areas are not communicating, that's what a network like this could show. Did I illustrate that in a fairly concrete, amusing way? I think so, yeah. That's that's one example. It's this idea of fit in a way, you know, that um, if you want to manage the ecological system, in that sense, the lizards on the golf course and in the neighboring forest, if you want to manage that in a meaningful way, then we need to have a governance system that somehow fits the ecological system, right? And the, and the ecological system, per se, they don't care that much if the golf course owner and the forest owner are not the same person. They move mm. from one to the other if they can, if there's no physical barriers, right? Birds don't really care if they fly over a national border. Yep. That doesn't exist in the, in the ecological system of birds. It might, of course, exist because based on our social behavior, we are creating borders, be they physical borders, yeah. like you could have in a water course with dams or yeah. stuff like that, right? They could be borders. Or you can create borders in a sense that you're complicating the movement from the golf course to the forest 
by not having the pond at the golf course at the right place so that the frog can actually use it to get from one habitat to the other. Yeah. And so we're looking at social networks in order to understand whether the right people in a way are talking to each other. And the right people would be those that are connected to parts of the ecological system that are again interrelated. So if, again, your example in a slightly different way, right? If there's the lizard that uh, moves from my garden to yours, it would probably not be too bad if we somehow coordinate on when we cut the grass in our garden. Oh yeah, that's true. And if we don't, then it's like clear that we're cutting the grass at the same time and the lizard doesn't have anywhere to hide anymore, right? True, it, true. I was just thinking, as you were saying that, like, do lizards like tall grass or no grass? I don't know. Uh, we have to ask an ecologist for that. Exactly. The importance of interdisciplinary knowledge, of course, is... Uh, I should do a format where I bring Janine back on and we have a three-way discussion on the podcast. Absolutely. I think it would be interesting. No, but definitely very powerful tool because it serves as a bit of a diagnostic to begin with of identifying where these lacks of collaborations are. And then with a lot of the research you've already developed as well around collaborations, you can sort of piece them together and create an environment for actors to then really see transparently where are the gaps, what can we do, what are our interests that we represent and hopefully you know overcome the devil shift, um, be more efficient and targeted so that you can support decision making, especially now in times of crisis where we're dealing with the climate crisis the biodiversity crisis all sorts of different types of crises i'm not sure if we're dealing with more crisis than before you think so i guess that's, that's a very just that's just the, the first sentence of every paper too because we want to make ourselves important uh, i'm not so sure if there's a perception issue in terms of crisis yeah of course there's things going on that we wouldn't like to see in that world but yeah again that's <laughs> um what I wanted to jump on is that the importance of having a political science knowledge and an interdisciplinary knowledge, if you're analyzing how people are interacting, you know, it's easy to say, again, the example from before, we as neighbors, we should talk to each other because that lizard needs, let's assume it needs high grass at all times of the yeah. year and we shouldn't cut that grass at the same time. So let's talk to each other. Yeah. It's also very easy for others to say, well, why don't they talk to each other? Mm. Obviously, they can do something for that lizard, and so they have to co-manage their gardens. I guess it's very We also know to, yeah. that very often neighbors are fighting, and there's social reasons for why we wouldn't talk to each other. Maybe we don't even have a space to talk to each other because you're driving with your car out of your garage and I'm doing the same thing. We never actually talk to each other and we don't have... Or uh, we've, we've been fighting for some other reason. And we don't talk to each other for that. So there's a lot of social and institutional reasons why people talk to each other or why they're not talking to each other. And that's the importance of also bringing, again, these, the stuff that we talked about before and the social science and the political science knowledge in general into these studies about ecological management or ecological governance mm. to understand that it's not just about telling these guys to collaborate more or to finally talk to each other in the sense of why don't they realize it's so easy. And from a social point of view, it's not so easy, no. right? And we need to understand how that works independently of the ecological system. And then we can bring both pieces of evidence together to have a proper understanding of why it's so difficult also to achieve collaboration yeah. at the right time and with the right partners, right? That's true. And in a way, that's also redefining the role of the scientists going forward into the future. You highlight in the Fukushima paper that under shock or crisis uh, situations, actors are less willing to really consult science because they're under that time constraint, that do something now moment that they can't deal with the complexity. But going forward, what do you think is critical for us as scientists in the role in this kind of sphere? Knowing about our role. I'm a, I'm a bit critical with respect to science claiming a big influence in policy processes. I guess I've been looking at policy processes independently of the role of science. And now I'm very much in that, in, in, in also in an institution who, who kind of claims that it wants to have an influence on society, etc. From our studies of political processes and political networks, we see that scientific organizations play a, an absolutely minor role mm. in, in those policymaking processes. They might play a role in more indirect ways, right? Of course, state actors, when they're preparing their material, they're talking to scientists, etc. But very often, I think we from scientific institutions, we overestimate the influence on political decision-making we're also overestimating our potential to actually do that. I mean, there's a lot of talking about we just need to do it better. I'm not so sure if if the political process per se is even 
receptive to more scientific input. There's many other logics and many other factors that influence political decision making. And of course, we as scientists, we need to communicate, I guess, also with the broader public. We need to get in touch with stakeholders and decision makers and try to talk to them. But I'm not so sure if we can really increase influence on political decisions mm. or if we should actually try to strive for that even. And so what's your, what's your next steps in your research going forward? I have no idea. Um, no i have to i have to say that i'm not currently maybe that's the step of the career or that's the i don't know there's not these big ideas that i've always wanted to study that drive me i guess they've probably never been i guess my motivation for doing research has always been a let's say maybe a social one like get involved into discussions with others, be it other social scientists, be it people across different disciplines and try to work on something together. I think I'm not the type of scientist who's chasing the big ideas, never have been, but always been motivated by the type of work, to, you know, trying to put together arguments, trying to have a consistent idea of what one could do to answer a specific question. But what that big question is out there, I have no idea. It might show itself in an emergent way, I guess, Maybe. going forward. Maybe. And that in itself is a perfect segue as well to get into the questions that I ask all my guests. And it's been a very fascinating discussion so far. And I'm looking forward to learning a bit more about what drives you. And you mentioned that inspiration. And it's really interesting to see a very different approach, that more bottom-up emergent kind of way of doing things, but also wanting to be involved. Was there a key moment, book, paper, person, or event that completely changed the course of your career or mindset? Completely changed the course of my career or mindset? I mean, the completely, no, certainly not. I didn't have anything to do with environmental policy before I applied here at Airlog as a postdoc. So yes, if I hadn't seen that, and if I didn't get that position, then I would probably not have moved into environmental stuff and probably not that much into interdisciplinary stuff. So in that sense, yes, that was a change in career. That was not the big recognition. It was rather, I was looking for a position and there it was. And it somehow organically and, and moved there, you. there, exactly, I, yeah. Hmm. But it's not, it's not even that I saw it and I was like, oh, I w- absolutely want to move in that direction. Hmm. It was just an opportunity for basically finding a postdoc position that I was looking for, but I was looking for any kind of post or position. Mm. So again, there's not the big idea that I wanted to follow. I just, yeah. I liked the type of work and, and wanted to continue that. I guess being open and flexible to different topics, I think is always a very powerful skill, a powerful mindset to have. It makes you more resilient as well in the face of uncertainty, wouldn't you think? Yeah, there's even, I think there's even an element of, again, of the social scientist Behind that, if you talk about topics, you know, whether it's about environmental decision making or security decision making or migration issues or social issues or crime or whatever, very often if we want to understand the political processes and the broader social process behind it, the theories are similar, right? Mm. It's about how political actors behave with different levels of uncertainty, with different levels of resources, with different types of social networks out there. And whether that is in a process on nuclear energy or on a new railway station in Dübendorf. Where we are currently sitting. The basic social processes are pretty much similar, I would say. Okay. Which is also, int- it's, of course, then it's interesting to kind of see what social processes are similar, independent of the substantive issue that we're talking about, and what social processes might actually be dependent on a specific issue. Yeah. And so with all these different, or this flexibility, if you had a magic wand and you could change one thing about the world, what would that be and why? Oof. Overnight. Oof. Uh, that's not a scientific question. <laughs> I'm a scientist. <laughs> could be a social question you're a social scientist <laughs> uh, uh, i stumped you in the world could be anything as a social scientist i know that things are not happening by chance overnight but it's very long processes of adaptation you get the na, NA. for this question i guess uh, <laughs> i think i definitely stumped you there <laughs> But if you ever come up with something, we'll put it in the show notes so that listeners can follow up. Good. What was one of the most challenging situations that you've ever faced in your career to date and how did you overcome it? I think 
being like working in an interdisciplinary institute as Irvog is is challenging in the sense that you're out of your comfort zone on a daily basis or on an hourly basis almost, right? I'm not sure if I have overcome it. I've gotten used to it. And I'm seeing the positive sides while also I don't want to hide the negative sides, right? It's not always nice to be all the time out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. It's not always nice to, in a way, sometimes I feel that I have to explain from zero again what we're doing and why that is important. Yep. And that can be very rewarding because people can give you nice discussions, etc. because it can be frustrating. Yep. The, on the other side, on the positive side, of course, you're challenged to actually really think about why what you're doing is important. You're not just in your home place and your nest where everyone accepts what you're doing, right? So I guess that's the challenge. It's not the one challenging moment. It's been there always. And I guess I found a way to deal with it by seeing, just accepting both the positive and negative aspects of that. That acceptance is often a very crucial step because it allows you to then adapt or think more flexibly or out of the box. Maybe. Yeah, certainly very interesting challenge to deal with. I think we are encouraged to deal with it a lot more going forward. We are. Yeah, we are encouraged to deal with it more, but we shouldn't forget that it's difficult and we sometimes need our home turf to be comfortable, yeah. to be comfortable for ourselves and to be able to build up the expertise that is needed to go into non-comfort zones. Mm. So it's not just about increasing the types of interesting interactions with people that you have never heard about your work and vice versa. You need the resources to be able to do that. I guess you need your couch every now Absolutely. and then so you can sit on the floor from time to time. Absolutely. Yeah. What tips and strategies can you offer in terms of time management? How do you maintain a balance between your professional and personal time? In general, I manage to do that quite well, I guess. Um, you certainly uh, choose really nice hotels when you go for conferences on the top of mountains. I do that, yes. Maybe that's not a tip, but I'm really not, I'm not passionate about the stuff I'm doing. It's just a job that I like to do it. But of course, if you're passionate about it and you want to do extra work, that's okay. I do the extra work if it's needed, but then it's, it's tricky just to give a tip because it's often about pers how, how people are functioning, mm. whether they can manage stress, in what way they manage stress, in what social context they're in, in their work, etc. I guess passion breeds expectation in towards your own, yourself towards yourself exactly and that can if it doesn't go well breed disappointment exactly and there's again there's positive points about that yeah. and there's dangerous points about that right yeah and it doesn't mean that it's bad to be passionate i think it's important but to be able to be realistic and understanding of it or accepting if things don't go the way you want it to absolutely yeah and again that's something that is hard to influence my social network on the private level <laughs> has not a lot to do with research and so that's not something that occupies my private life and i'm rarely talking about my job mm. during my private life which i guess is you know it can be important if you're really struggling it can be good to talk to someone also outside of your professional world very often once i leave office then i'm just elsewhere in another world and switching off for switching the day. off for the day but of course that's it's easy to say you got to do that. It's much harder to do that if you yeah. don't manage to do that. And, and I've been in situations where I didn't manage to switch off and I realize, and that's tricky, right? Yeah, but I guess it's trainable. Probably. Yeah. I have not, <laughs> I have not trained it. But certainly a very good piece of advice. And I think we need to be able to because if we can switch off and come back to it with a fresh mind, we're often more creative, more innovative, and also efficient in a way. Certainly more efficient. More yeah. creative and innovative, I don't know, but <laughs> efficient, yes, more relaxed. Well, we're probably doing better work. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. And so what other advice can you offer to young researchers, young social scientists starting out? Uh, what I always say to people that think about potentially doing a PhD is that I think they need to like the way a researcher stays structured and the researcher work, right? You're spending a lot of time on your own. Mm -hmm. Let's say the social sciences, is you're in a lab or in a group and you're talking to people, etc. But it's also a lot about being behind your screen, reading stuff, doing your data analysis. You can write a social science PhD basically alone. Mm. And you need to like to work in that way. Yeah. Just, you know, having the goal of being a professor one day or having the goal of changing the world one day, that will not bring you through the, the dark days of uh, 
of hour long data coding and data yeah. cleaning and reading through literature that sometimes is relevant and sometimes is totally irrelevant, but it's still important that you go through it. So I encourage them to think about whether their motivation is the type of work and the type that such a position functions and not the goal they want to achieve. Yeah. While the goal might also be important, but if it's only the goal, then I wouldn't go into a research. They'll track. be in for a shock when they see the process. Absolutely. It's a, a stark reality check, but it's a very essential one also to protect your own mental and emotional state because it is a journey. It is a journey. And I see, I guess I see a lot of young people nowadays, specifically in environmental sciences, right? Being motivated by doing something about the bad state of the world climate and the world biodiversity, etc. Which is absolutely good to see all those people being motivated and wanting to do something. But it's also very important that you realize that you're not going to be able to do something on the first day. Yeah. And doing a PhD or going to a research journey is maybe not the most efficient way of actually doing something. If doing something about our future is your main motivation, then you should go directly into politics, I would say, mm -hmm. as a political scientist, right? Like work in some associations. There you have a more immediate feeling of having an influence. True, uh, you true. don't get that through science. It's a slow grind. And everybody's talking about, and that's, I think, is even a bit dangerous. Like people are talking about, oh, we need to have more influence. Science should try to have more influence in society. The younger people that go into scientific journey, they hear that. And they're also motivated by that, right? Mm. I think at least part of that is a bit of a lie. <laughs> um, it's not so easy. Yep. And we shouldn't let them think that it's easy. Do you think that the ivory tower imagery still applies a lot in academia and science? Or is that slowly crumbling? I'm not sure if it's crumbling. It might have gone worse. Oh. Just because we're all saying that we don't want to be in the ivory tower doesn't mean that we're getting out of the ivory tower, right? Mm. There's this one episode that also comes from political networks and policy stuff. There's a long-term study at the University of Lausanne where they've been looking into the typical kind of careers of Swiss elites. Mm -hmm. And in the 70s and 80s, you'd have these people that are professors at the same time as they are members of parliament, at the same time as they are head of the local government, etc. Of course, nowadays, that's much harder to actually have it. There's none of these careers anymore. Mm. But these were natural ways of stepping out of the ivory tower. So the specialization, the complexification of stuff and the specialization that goes with it also pushes us back into the ivory tower mm. to some degree, right? So I'm not even sure if we're, I think we're much more talking about the problematic aspect of the ivory tower. I'm not sure if we're really going in that direction. We want to, but and we realize that we probably need to or we need to think about the doors of the ivory tower at least and when we're moving out and in again. But overall, I'm not even sure if we're on the right track there. Food for thought to leave with you listeners as we wrap up this episode. Where can people find you if you want to get in touch? Um, my phone number. <laughs> <laughs> no, people can find me on the Yelp page. And I have actually no social network. I have passive social network presence. Okay. But not on LinkedIn. I guess it's uh, you work with the real social networks. Absolutely. But we'll definitely put these links and everything we've spoken about in the show notes so that listeners can learn a lot more about you and the work you do. But Manuel, thank you so much. It's been a very fascinating conversation and lots of, I think, good reality checks as well for us going forward to try and tackle a lot of these crises and challenges in the future. But as I do with every guest, I always give my guest the final say. So one last message for the listeners to take away from today. The political world out there is very complex and very messy. Don't expect any big rational decisions that we can rationally influence. Thank you very much. And that wraps up our complex, real and eye-opening episode with Manuel Fischer. For more information on shaping your own presidential campaign, suggestions on conference hotels off the beaten track, or just some devilish wisdom on collaborating during crises, check out the show notes for more information over at peterambach.com slash podcast. And as always, thank you listeners for tuning in to this episode and for your feedback and support. If you're enjoying the show, I would be incredibly grateful if you could share this podcast with your family, friends, colleagues, or even fellow neighbors. Please also do subscribe or follow this podcast on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you're listening from to be notified of the latest release as soon as it becomes available. If you're curious about me or my work in general, you can also check out my website or social media. Head to peterambach.com, my YouTube channel, Peter Marcus Bach, that's Marcus with a C, or follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Peter M. Bach, or Instagram, at Peter M. Bach 87 Feel free to reach out to me with any feedback or guest suggestions so that I can keep improving this show. 
The podcast's intro and outro song is called Starsky by Alex Kieran. Stay tuned for our next episode and next guest to hear how they are tackling the grand challenges. <laughs>